This is Leslie from Whiskey is My Yoga, and you're listening to Travel Feels Life. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Travel Fuels Life, the show where we share stories, tips, and inspiration to help you live a travel lifestyle. I'm your host, Drew Hanish, and I am busy planning out my Castles and Drams tour of Ireland and Scotland. And this all came about because I had gone to Kentucky and Tennessee about a year ago, and I did 19 distilleries between the two, did them in eight days, yes. And so I enjoyed that so much, I decided that I need to go to Scotland and do the same thing. So it's kind of tough to figure out how to plan out these trips because of trying to figure out how to get to the distilleries, make sure you're not breaking any laws while you're doing this, being safe as you possibly can be, and going to the best distilleries you can plan out. And so... I developed a little guide around the Kentucky experience that I had, but I have no guide to work off of for going to Scotland. And when I went to Kentucky, there was no guide for it. But this time, I got a little leg up here because I met Leslie McBride, who is also known as Whiskey Is My Yoga on Instagram, and we struck up a conversation. She's been to Isla, which is a region of Scotland, an island in Scotland, which is one of my favorites. And also, she's been to Glasgow. So, who better to go to for some whiskey travel planning hacks than somebody who has been there? And so, she's going to help me out. Hopefully, she helps you out as well. And she also spent a lot of time in Kentucky doing bourbon tours as well. So, this is a great opportunity for me to have a little back and forth with somebody and kind of compare notes on our experiences and maybe some stuff that she missed or stuff that I missed along the way. So from my home here in Greenville, South Carolina, it's time to jump on the World Wide Web and connect with Leslie McBride of Whiskey Is My Yoga from her home in Washington, D.C. Hey, Leslie, how you doing? Good. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. Well, I got to tell you, coming back from Kentucky, I was so energized. I mean, so much information in my head. I wanted to share all of that information. I wanted to talk to people and maybe do some tastings and stuff and share all that knowledge that I had. So when you're doing these distillery tours, how do you deal with and what do you what do you do when you come back home? How do you share with your friends? Um, so like I get really excited because a lot of my friends love whiskey too. So whenever I come back from a trip, I got this little like um it's called bar to go. So I can fit like five little pours in it and I get really excited because I have new whiskeys and I want to share them and let everyone try and be like oh my god I found this new little distillery no one knows about and everyone (laughs) should know about like when we were offline I talked to you about the Southern Distilling Company Mm -hmm. they're one of the ones when I came back and I'm like oh my god you have to try this rye it's amazing so I like will take little pours of it and everyone thinks I'm weird because like it fits right in my purse so other people like have their pores like, here, try this, try that, try this. And I'm like, oh, I got something for you. <laughs> and I just pull it right out of my bag. They're like, who are you? And where did you come from? <laughs> you come prepared. I do. Like I always like end up hanging out with like industry people or brand ambassadors and they always have something special. And I never want to be that person that's like, well, I don't have anything for you. So, so tell me where this name comes from. Whiskey is my yoga. How did you come up with that? Oh my God. So... One of my like things is I love to convince people who don't like whiskey that they do love whiskey because they just don't know that they love whiskey yet. It's one of those common misconceptions. Mm -hmm. They think they don't. They really don't. And um, I'm hanging out at my local whiskey bar and my best friend calls me. She's getting out of yoga and she had I had like three years worth of notes before I started my blog. Like I'd been going on distillery tours and all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. And she had been bugging me to start it forever because she's like. I'm sick of you like talking to random strangers every time we go out to convince them they like whiskey. I'm sitting there with like my glass of scotch, like I have in my hand now, (laughs) just like completely like trying to zone out from my day. Like I'm just alone at the bar and she calls me and she just got out of yoga. She's talking about like the Zen feeling she gets and like how relaxed it makes her. And she's like, it's just a way to get rid of all my stress. I'm like, you know what? In a long day, 
like to take that deep breath of scotch mm-hmm. and enjoy it. And then I just let all my stress out. I'm like, whiskey <laughs> is my yoga. That's what it is. And she's like, I think we just found your blog name. Well, let's talk about your blog and how you source out all your content for it. Um, do you just head to like a liquor store and start looking at bottles on the shelf and say, Ooh, I haven't been there before. And I haven't been there before to figure out which distilleries you're going to, or, or do you go by recommendations or so, uh, obviously I went to Isla because like Isla was my first love. So I had to go to Isla mm-hmm. and then I love Campbelltown whiskey. So like my Scotland trip was a little more planned out, but when I'm in the States, I'm just like going on trips to places with friends or I'm like couch surfing across the country, going to see family. And then I just Google or Yelp every distillery in the area when I get there. And then I go check them all out. And it, do you now you, since you're doing the blog, do you kind of give them a heads up that you're, you're going to show up and then try to, um, you know, maybe talk with the distiller if you get an opportunity to, or how do you work that out? Um, it really depends on what I want to do. Um, most of my first visits, I like to do blind because I want to know what everybody gets when they walk in. Mm -hmm. And then like at the end, I'll be like, Hey, this is who I am. I write this blog and I always send out my stuff ahead of time because I might've misheard something. I might've misspelled someone's name. I don't like to misrepresent these people. They aren't going to change my opinion or change my mind in any way from the experience that I had or my, what I think of their whiskeys, but they can definitely like, Peerless changed their um, small back to a flagship name mm-hmm. before I wrote about it. And something like that, that's a really easy thing for me to fix. And I want to accurately represent these distilleries because I really like the ones that I'm writing about. Yeah. Is, is, is Peerless the one that has all the cats? Uh, Peerless is the one that has rye. There's a lot of distillery cats. Peerless <laughs> has rye. And I definitely put Rye on my blog a lot. Yeah. Because, like, he's my buddy. Like, I go in, I'll, like, pick him up and walk around with him. Like, <laughs> I look like Dr. Evil. Like, I'm just, like, petting the cat as I walk through the distillery. Yeah, that's, that's He's a, such a sweetheart. That's funny. Because when I went to uh, Willet, uh, they had cats over there. And I said, um, what's the deal with cats? Because I keep seeing cats in all the distilleries and or in, in certain distilleries. And they said, it's mice. M- mice, yes. So it's if you like cats, distillery tours are are the thing to do. <laughs> so, so so how does your opinion of a whiskey change after you do a distillery tour? Do you do you sometimes after having that experience just take something that you thought oh, yeah, that was all right, and then all of a sudden it, it kind of changes your whole opinion of the whiskey? Or well, I love family stories. It's one of those things where like distillery stories, how they got started. Um, It just really intrigues me because every whiskey has a story behind it. Generally, you don't get someone who's like, well, I just woke up one day and started a distillery. No, it's like people are really passionate about it. Mm -hmm. And I love to hear like what they're passionate about and why they're excited about it. But the thing that I think changes my mind most is usually on the distillery tours, you'll get like something a little extra. Like you'll get the distillery exclusive. You get like the one that they're really proud of and you get to try it. and it like just changes your mind about the entire like brand and it that's wonderful i love that experience well um so let's let's talk a little bit about um about your scott scotland trip because this is one that i'm just about to take and one of the things that i wanted to figure out when i went on my kentucky tour was I had no idea, you know, I'm thinking you're going to be drinking whiskey and I'm a solo traveler and how am I going to be able to do this while driving my car and all of those little logistics that you have to sort of work out Mm -hmm. and which tours are going to be good and which tours maybe not so good. And so, um, Scotland, I've been doing a little bit of reading on it. The thing I like about Kentucky is that, um, it's 0.08 is the alcohol level. I did a little uh, calculator that kind of figured out how many drinks. Oh my... yeah. There's nothing in Scotland. You aren't allowed to drink there. 
They have a zero tolerance policy. Okay. Okay. So see, this is the stuff that I, I need to know and planning this out. Cause what I found in Kentucky was that you could go to a distillery and they could only give you one shot's worth, which um, yeah. unless you're an extreme lightweight, one shot is not going to be enough to impair your driving over the legal limit in Kentucky. So it's and- especially because it's like an hour tour. You have at least like 45 minutes between each distillery. Right. Like you can only sensibly hit up three distilleries in a day. Yeah. I've tried to do more. It is not a thing that can be done. So when you're in Scotland, how did you plan your trip out then? Did you try to, did you take public transportation around? Uh, were you renting a car? How did you, uh, how'd you handle that? So my trip to Scotland was interesting. Um, I ended up getting a free flight over, but it was a space available flight. Mm-hmm. So I took that to Germany and then I got a random flight to Scotland but it took me a few days to get a spot on the flight to Europe. And then I was in Germany for a few days. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't like call ahead or booking in my hotel. So it was like spur of the moment backpacker style, like say la vie going to go and like (laughs) do the backpacking thing that I never got to do in my undergrad, but with actual money. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I went and I did a lot of Airbnbs and what I did is I went to Glasgow and you can take a bus from Glasgow to Isla. Mm-hmm. And then when you get to Isla, you can get a taxi to wherever you go. And I know you're going to Isla, so I'll probably focus there a little more. Okay. But um, when you go to Isla, there are like three main areas of Isla. So you have the, if I had to do over again and I could book my trip, I would book a day in Beaumont, mm-hmm. a, a day near. Um, Lafroy, Ardbeck, and Le Gobelin. Mm-hmm. And then a day on the other side of the island near Bunahaben and Kalila. And I w- I, I'm sad I didn't get to hit up Jura, but I'm really happy I got to Campbelltown anyway. Mm. So you can also go to Jura, but it's like a day trip and there's one distillery there. Mm-hmm. I was really dead set on going to Campbelltown, so I missed that. <laughs> but I did go to every distillery in Isla and Lafroy has been one of my loves forever. So that distillery got like its own day plan for it. And then I went and hung out in Ardbeck a little bit again for a second time. So describe to people what a Isla Scotch is all about. So they, they kind of get an idea because uh, uh, I did not like them at first. And then I fell in love with them. What, what is it about Isla Scotches? So Isla Scotches are known for being like smoky, peaty, iodiny. And I found out that Isla Scotches were the U.S. government's pick to allow in during Prohibition because of their sort of medicinal flavor. Mm -hmm. So Americans, even more than other places, identify it as medicinal because it's a history of that. Mm. But like what I found when I was there is um, especially like Bunahaben and Brookladi have some unpeated Scotches utterly amazing like some places are going a little light on the pea and getting a different flavor profile like the uh lafroy cartus this year Mm -hmm. it it has a nice light smoky flavor a little fruity like uh i one of my favorite people actually works at jack rose or you want to head in dc harvey he describes it as a great breakfast whiskey Mm. But the thing I love about most Islas, especially after you go there, is you get that nice salt air and you can just like taste it. Like when I sit and I drink an Isla Scotch now, it reminds me of like in the mornings. I would I stayed in Beaumont the whole time I was there. Mm-hmm. You walk down the hill to catch the bus and there is just this beautiful ocean salt air smell. And I loved it. Mm. Absolutely love it, but I can taste it every time I have an Isla <laughs> or a Scotland Isla Scotch. I l- absolutely adore it, but they're a bit more harsh. Um, when you go to Brook Lottie, request to try their um, unpeated, unaged whiskey mm-hmm. because I swear to God that stuff could replace any schnapps I've ever had. It <laughs> really? is fruity and beautiful and amazing. Like you'd be surprised about the unaged whiskeys. Mm. So, so this was my first experience with Isla Scotch was that uh, I tried Ardbeg and I took a sip of it. And as soon as I took a sip of it, I said, you know, for a guy who can't pick out flavors, 
this one has a really distinct flavor and I, I can't, I can't, I can't put my finger on it. And then when I finally did figure it out, I said, it tastes like band-aids. And that was the iodine. Uh. That was the iodine. And then, um, as I drank it, uh, further, I, I went, um, well, kind of reminds me of an ashtray. <laughs> so this was not a romantic kind of, uh, introduction to Isla Scotch, but, it's funny because I had a friend of mine come over and we were doing some tastings and he said, I want to try that art bag. So I poured him a little and he went, Ooh, this is like a campfire. And I thought <laughs> he just relabeled it and made it sound so much more romantic than my band aid in an ashtray. And, um, and, and, and then it was funny because I started to try to teach myself what it was that I could like about this particular whiskey. And then I tried Lafroig. And I think Lafroig has not got quite such a an alcohol bite to it as as Ardbeg does. So it it was a little more pleasant. It depends on which one you have, but um, a good amount of Lafroigs are proofed down a little bit. So especially for a beginner, it's a great great segue. Yeah, to and, like get you into the Isla feel. And so, and so what I found interesting about it was that I had always been looking for scotches and judging them by the amount of of sweetness that they had. A rookie mistake, I guess. But when I when I thought about Lafroy, I the things you were talking about, tasting the the salt and the sea air in it and and the smokiness, I thought that when I drink it, I think it tastes like beef brisket. Uh, and, and it has all of that kind of savory kind of flavor to it. And now that I think of it as a, as a savory scotch, I love it. And it's my favorite scotch. So that's that was one of the reasons why I wanted to go to Isla. So it's it's funny. It's how- definitely a perception thing and like what you think. Mm-hmm. And what else you'll get in Isla is when they're smoking the peat, like that smoky scent. Mm-hmm. You'll have that. And there, I lucked out. I had one half rainy sort of cold day like i just i didn't even need a jacket i just had like a little zip up and was fine and the rest of the time was utterly beautiful a lot of places had to start their silent season early last year Mm -hmm. because they weren't getting enough rain and their sources of water dried up Mm. but the peat was just like the peat smell and the smoke around, like the feel and the flavors are definitely like in Isla. Like as you go around, it just like gives me good memories to drink an Isla scotch anymore. Mm. Like I just get happy with it. And I loved it beforehand. Like it was my first love. So I had to have loved it. Yeah. Well, so did you, um, did you go to any bars while you were there? Did you kind of mix that in? So I spent way too much time at Lucci's. If when you go, it is the Bowmore Inn. The bar is called Lucci's and it's named after the owner because he always dresses so fancy. And literally when you go talk to the bartenders, cause they're absolutely amazing. There's old Peter and young Peter and young Peter knows everything. Like we used to play guess the scotch and he would get me like every time because you know, Isla's have these very distinctive flavors that we all look for. And I'm pretty good at picking out like the standard stuff we have over here. I can usually guess the distillery pretty easily Mm -hmm. especially on my islands like i pride myself on that he would pick out stuff and i'm like i don't even think this from this island he's like (laughs) uh here you go yeah like these magical super fruity islas like these single bottlings that they have it was just so much fun i feel like i spent a ton of time there um (laughs) There's a couple of good places on both of the ports. Like as soon as you get off of the ports, like the first hotel you see on each side is amazing as well. And get some seafood while you're there. Mm. They have like these oversized shrimp things Uh that I can't pronounce the name of. They're orange. They're amazing. Eat them. Trust me. (laughs) Well, and I'm staying in Port Ellen. So um, I'm going to be doing. Oh, nice. Yeah. So I'll be doing all my bus trips from there. But I I got an Airbnb there with the idea that I've got three distilleries within walking distance of myself. So maybe I can do that. But did you pick up buses in between uh, when you did that? Or is it is it pretty decent to walk? So I would get the buses in the morning, but probably plan on taxiing back in the afternoon. Okay. because you'll probably be out longer than the buses are. Mm-hmm. And honestly, I made friends on my tours and I hitchhiked a lot because ah. I would miss my bus and I just walk down the street and I'd be like, maybe someone will pick <laughs> me up. But Isla is so safe. It's so safe. By the time I got back to my bar, 
Like they already knew who brought me home. Mm. It was insanity. It was like small town USA, except <laughs> for times a million. Yeah. So how long did it take for you to get used to the um, Scotch accent? Um. So I spent a few days in Glasgow before I headed to Isla. I spent like two days and I went to check out the William Wallace monument, be like Braveheart, yeah. see a castle. <laughs> Cause how do you go to Scotland and not see a castle? Right. So I was around a lot of people. It took me a little while, but I'm pretty upfront and I'm like, Hey, can you repeat that? Can you talk a little slower? Okay. No issues. Right. <laughs> and everybody was really, really friendly, especially when they figured out I was traveling by myself. I feel like half a bow more like, knew who I was and like kept an eye out on me. They were so sweet. Mm. So, so sweet. I loved the little like small town feel and how kind everybody was. Mm. Probably my favorite thing about being there. So did you, did you get a chance to, um, I mean, it's right next door. I say that, but, uh, have, have you ever been to Ireland? I have not been to Ireland. Uh, I decided that I thought about going to Ireland for a day, but at the same time, cause you can take a, trip from Campbelltown. Mm -hmm. So I had that internal debate. Do I want to go to um, Ireland for a day and see what it has to offer? Or do I really want to spend my time in Campbelltown? And then I got a really good deal on Airbnb in a great area of Glasgow. Mm -hmm. So instead of taking a ferry to Ireland for a day, I went over to Glasgow. But Northern Ireland, from what I, I talked to some people when I was thinking about going there, I guess their whole logistics chain isn't the same because I just caught buses at the ports. Like I took a bus to the port that takes you over to Isla and then I caught a bus from that port over to Campbelltown and then a bus back to Glasgow. Mm -hmm. And then I went to Glen Goyne up in Glasgow. I caught buses there, all of that. But I guess in Ireland, you really have to have a car and I wanted to avoid driving at all costs. Yeah. No drinking and driving. Right. Yeah, like I don't want to be responsible for any of the bad things that might happen. <laughs> so I try to avoid that no matter what. If there's no car, there's no temptation. Right. So the way I planned out my whole Scottish trip was to make sure that I always had the distillery at the end of the day. So make sure that wherever I'm staying, I can you know drop my car off at, at that spot and then ride out to the distillery or walk out to the distillery and then come back. Um, <laughs> An amazing thing about Scotland, they do to-go pours. So if you're the driver, they'll do a to-go pour for you, and you can just take it to go and um, sit and enjoy it at your leisure. Well, and I saw you pouring a, a bottle. I guess they some some of the distilleries will let you pour your own from the cask. And yes, on the warehouse tour. So, so I specifically got the Lef so Lefroy was a half day for me. Uh -huh. I got their long tour. I wanted to do a hand filled. Like I was super excited. I've been a friend of Lafroig forever. Mm -hmm. By the way, if you're not a friend of Lafroig, go buy a bottle, enter the code, and you'll get your one foot of land in Scotland. You'll get your deed to it, which mm -hmm. is amazing. <laughs> and then they pay you they pay you rent, so you get a mini bottle of Lafroig as rent for free ah. on your land because you bought a bottle and it's so cool like I have my mini bottle I haven't drank it I don't think I'll ever drink it I'll keep it forever <laughs> but it's so cool they pay you rent on your land oh that's awesome yeah because I have one of those I haven't uh, sent it in yet so I guess I need to do that before I hit my trip it, just go online. It's a really easy sign up process. It's amazing. Okay. And and so that brings up the other question, which is how much whiskey can you bring back with you uh, to the U.S.? So legally you can bring back um, it something like it's something like two of the larger bottles. Mm hmm. But they charge a 3% tax on the rest when you bring it back in, which is nothing. Right. Like literally just keep at, track of your whiskey, bring back as much as you can carry because I don't even care how much you bring back. Like come back with one of the rare bottles, sell it when you get here. It's going to go for more than any tax would. Like as long as you come back with under a case, they aren't going to get too picky with you. Okay. And did you find that when you were in Glasgow that uh, there were like liquor stores that you wanted to walk into just to see what, what prices were and see if there was something extra that you wanted to take home? Oh my goodness. Yes. Hold on <laughs> one second. Let me look up my spot in Glasgow because it is 
utterly amazing. Like this one liquor store. I don't know if you saw the post like on my birthday, but I have a birthday scotch that I found at this liquor store. And oh my goodness, the name is like failing me right now. Horribly. <laughs> we can put it in the show notes afterwards. So, all right. So for instance, like Lafroig is my favorite. So here, if I were going to buy a bottle, it's going to range anywhere from 50 to $55. Is it, is it worth buying a bottle of that while you're over there and bringing it back because it's significantly less, or is it better to go look for some, um, rare whiskeys that you can't really buy over here? I mean, you go to Lafroig, you're going to get a rare whiskey. Like, um, that's one of the places I did my hand pulled. I did, uh, if you get a chance to do a warehouse tour, mm -hmm. I 150% recommend it. It's like 20 pounds. So it's only like 10 pounds more than a normal tour. Mm -hmm. But you'll get to try things that the public will never get to try. Mm -hmm. And like, so Lafroy is a little more expensive because they have a full tour. And then they have that. And your bottle is included in the price. Mm -hmm. Other places you have to buy the bottle separately. But Buna Hobbin lets you pull a bottle, and Lafroig lets you pull a bottle. And the other thing is, you're going to find stuff in these places that you won't ever see anywhere either. Like, I have a bottle of Le Goblin from the festival this year. I have um, a hand poured Buna Hobbin. I have a hand poured uh, Octomore. I'm really, really upset with myself for. I was going to get like three bottles from Bowmore mm -hmm. and ended up like, I was like, okay, I'm going to get them right before I leave because I was stupid. And I'm like, I'm going to backpack through Europe. So I took an actual backpack. Terrible. idea, <laughs> Terrible. But it's just one of those things where I was like rom romanticized and forgot I was going to be carrying like 40 pounds of whiskey with me. Right. Everywhere I went. <laughs> And you can get stuff you'll never see in the States. Like, that's the thing is it's not the rare or the cheaper price. Like, you'll never see this in the States. Mm. So it's stuff you'll never get to buy or try again. And I, I just love it. Like, I have bottles that I just, like, stare at. <laughs> okay, I'm going to have to work on my budget for whiskey on this particular trip then, it sounds like. I mean, you probably should, and you're most likely going to go over it because <laughs> you'll see things. You'll be like, ooh, pretty. <laughs> All right, so um, let's let's uh, kind of talk a little bit about Kentucky and Tennessee. And you actually surprised me. You said you have not been through Tennessee. You're about you live in Washington. You're about to move to Louisville, Kentucky, which will put you right in the middle of all of this sort of stuff. So, if somebody's planning out a Kentucky tour and wanting to pick out the best places to go, what what would be some of the distilleries that would be top on your list in Kentucky? Oh my goodness. Well, of course, like I am moving to Louisville, so I'm real excited about that. By the way, it's like the first place I've announced this on. So ah, okay. You, you get like the exclusive on that. <laughs> but when you go to Louisville, like definitely check out the tours in downtown Louisville. Cause like the Urban Still House, that can be anywhere between like a 10 minute stop in to an hour long. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you went to the Evan Williams experience. Oh, I loved it. I did. But, the, I did the chocolate tasting, the chocolate pairing. Oh my, God, that was oh, incredible. So cool. Yeah. And then I actually really like their stuff is really animated and it's really commercialized, mm -hmm. but it's a really cool story anyway. Yeah. So it, it's a nice thing. I am going to Mickner's next week when I go to Kentucky. Ah. So I'm really excited for that. And Pamela is another female master distiller, so I represent. Ah, uh, and that one just opened up, and uh, it wasn't there when I uh, when I went to Louisville. So it's it's fun to see all of these distilleries coming back down to Whiskey Row. Oh yeah, and then Old Forester has their own cooperage, which is which is cool as long as it's operational. Mm -hmm. It was not actually working the day I went through, which oh, is a little sad. It is so cool. I got so to see that. I don't want to promise it to everybody. Yeah, because I'm like it. What they don't do it for every tour, but if they did it. Like, it'd be cool. Mm -hmm. However, like, Peerless is my hands-down favorite. Love Peerless. Because I was talking about, like, the layers of flavor and rye. Peerless taught me to truly appreciate rye with their tasting. Because mm -hmm. what they do... Did you go to Peerless? I did not go to Peerless. 
oh, you break my heart. <laughs> so more reasons to go to Kentucky, right? Yes. So <laughs> their family story is amazing. It has everything from like Al Capone to General Patton to like having to work the system with the U.S. government. It's insane. Uh. But their tasting made me fall in love with rice like all over again because I already liked rice, but. What they do is they give you their flagship rye, mm-hmm. which their rye is not cheap, but they have mini bottles now, so people can still get some of it if they don't want to buy like an expensive bottle. However, they give you their flagship rye, and then they give you these single barrels to try with it. And it is utterly amazing to taste the single barrels and then go back and look for the flavors in the flagship. It is one of my favorite things to do. Because when they guide you through the tasting, you won't do that. So it was the second tasting I was at there that I actually went through and did that. And it is fantastic once you do. Like, you really discover the flavors. Like, Peerless is one of those pours I'll sit with for an hour and just keep getting new tastes and flavors out of it. Mm. So you surprised me because when I read your your blog post and the places that you uh, mentioned in there, uh, I I went. I didn't go to any of those. I didn't go to Lux Row. I didn't go to Bourbon Thirty. I didn't go to Castle and Key. I wanted to go to Castle and Key because I went to uh, Glens Creek right down the road from there and passed by it. But I think it was closed when I was uh, was there that particular day. So may I say, Castle and Key is like my ideal fairy tale of everything. Like a whiskey distillery that is also a castle. Like <laughs> it appeals to like whiskey lover me and princess me. Uh, so I adore castle and key and everything it's ever represented. And they haven't even made their whiskey yet. They haven't finished it. Well, that was what I was wondering is that uh, I think when I went by it, I, I had realized or learned that they actually didn't have anything on the market yet. Um, they have their gin and vodka on the market now. Okay. And their gin is amazing. Um, Fortunately, like vodka gives me horrible migraines the minute I drink it, but the smell of it was wonderful. (laughs) Well, I guess that answers my other question, which is, uh, you know, a lot of these places when they first get started out, they can't sell whiskey because it has to age. And so they find other spirits to sell. And I wondered how many of those other spirits you usually tend to try. Um, Whenever I go to the distillery, I try everything but vodka because obviously it's it's not a good day for me afterwards. I have to go spend like four hours with sunglasses and pain. I definitely love to try their unaged whiskeys as well. A lot of people can't pick up flavor profiles in them, but I think, I don't know. I've done somewhere around 50 some tours of different distilleries now across the U S and Scotland. Mm -hmm. So I picked up on like the flavor profiles of a lot of them. And some of them actually don't have much of a flavor profile initially. And some of it develops over time, but the ones that I can pick like a really good flavor profile out of initially are the ones that I'm like, Ooh, this is going to be special. Mm. And then, um, with what is it? So still whiskey in Austin, Texas, what they do is pretty cool because they don't flavor their whiskey. What they do is they infuse it. So they infuse it with like peppers and orange peels and some other stuff. Mm-hmm. And, Oh my God, I did not think anything could convince me that a gimlet, that you can make a better gimlet with whiskey than gin, mm-hmm. but their like orange peel infused whiskey is amazing and it makes one of the best cocktails I've ever had in my life. So you do something, or you will try something that I usually don't tend to do, which is, uh, you know, with beer, I like to have added flavors in but in whiskey it's like maybe that's my snobbery (laughs) i don't like to drink any whiskeys that have anything infused into them other than uh you know the the ingredients that are standard to uh, making whiskey so you don't mind stretching the bounds a little bit so i don't mind trying flavored whiskeys but usually things are flavored with a lot of sugar and that is the syrupy texture bothers me as like a personal thing, Uh but I use a lot of stuff like that when I cook because it's fun to cook with and make things out of. So I'll taste it and then I'll like use it for other things aside from drinking. Yeah. What I like about this is it's not actually flavored. It's infused. So it's sort of like water. It's like the difference between like putting tang in your drink and the difference between like putting an orange peel in there to get the Uh flavor. Uh Uh-huh. So it's really, you still get those nice textures of the liquor. You still get the 
hints of that like new make uh vibe to it Mm -hmm. but it has um a little bit touch that's different and even their plain new make i don't mind drinking at all yeah what like i'm not gonna say it's my favorite whiskey but i can definitely drink it straight i can drink it in old fashioned. it has a nice mixing and blending profile Mm. so um outside of kentucky outside of scotland ireland uh, where are other places that we should pay attention to in terms of whiskeys? Uh, Washington State, 100%. Really? So they're doing a bit of a different thing. So I don't know if you've heard about the American Single Malt Movement. You told me you've heard of Strana Hands out in Colorado. They're another one that does it. Okay. Virginia Distilling Company does a single malt that's wonderful. Mm-hmm. But a cool thing that they're doing in Washington State is they're using like different types of beer yeast in their mash. So as opposed to like Kentucky, that usually has a really sour mash Mm -hmm. and like I've, I've drank a lot of mash between here, Scotland, almost every distillery I go to, I asked to try their mash. I asked to try their white dog because I love to see the progression in the whiskey. I just, it fascinates me Mm -hmm. anyway, nerd life, (laughs) but really cool thing that they're doing. Like their mash actually tastes like a beer. Like I could sit and drink. It tastes like an uncarbonated beer. Huh. Sit and drink a glass of it. I actually sat with the master distiller for Copperworks and hung out with him and drank a glass of his mash, tried some of his white dog, like utterly amazing. Cause he wasn't really into distilling, but the brewing scene was a little overdone. And so he's, he wanted to try his hand on it and see what he could do. So he did a lot of research and went and found his partner. Eventually they want to move into like selling their mash with their whiskey. Mm-hmm. So they'll like sell the actual beer. They'll make the beer for it and then they'll sell it with the whiskey. So you can get your whiskey that was made with that like mash bill, ah. which is really cool, but it, it gives it the whiskey a completely different profile. Mm-hmm. By the way, I found Copperworks before I knew much of anything about whiskey and loved it. And then I went back because I loved it so much and just adored the tour. The owner was great. Like gave me a whole like overview of that single malt whiskey, but he goes to, he used to be distill in several notable distilleries out there. Mm -hmm. And now he wants to do his own stuff. And I completely, I'm like, I see that. Like you do a great job of their whiskeys and their whiskeys won a lot of awards. Hmm. So I'm really interested in this like new trend that's going on with can like a better mash make a better whiskey. Like I don't want to like change every whiskey, obviously, because I love what bourbon's doing. But it's really interesting to see that change in dynamic. And I love new whiskey flavors. Mm hmm. So I get really excited over that stuff. So so it's funny because when I was in Kentucky, that there were two different distilleries that I went to that had uh, malt, Kentucky straight malt whiskey. And one was um, the Altec distiller in Lexington. And the other was Woodford Reserve. They just actually came out with a Kentucky straight malt whiskey. And it's it's really good. So because you, you and I were talking about that our first impressions of Woodford Reserve were not good ones. But at, um, uh, having tried the uh, malt, I, re- I really like that. Um, have, you, have you had that before? I haven't, actually. I'll have to check them out. But Woodford, like I said, Woodford, like they did their uh, sensory tasting with all of their pairings. And they won me over. Like I sat and I enjoyed my Woodford, yeah. which is definitely the first time I've done that. But I feel like the first time you find that thing that makes you enjoy the whiskey, yeah. like you remember the good parts every time you try it after. So so talk about uh, tours then. What are the best uh, all immersive tours that you've been on? So this is going to sound super cliche, but the best all-inclusive tour that I've been on is Jim Beam in Claremont. So if you're just going on a standard tour of a place, they'll walk you through and you get to go from everything. You get to see their water source. You get to see their mash. You get to try their mash. Mm. You get to see their white dog, which they will splash on your hand and they can't do anything about what you do with your hands. So (laughs) although they can't actually serve it to you, they'll pour it out of the barrel in front of you just on your everyday tour, Mm. which is something you really, I haven't seen in many other places. Mm -hmm. So they do that. They do a good overview of every single whiskey. They talk about their like quality control process, their 
historical bottles, all kinds of stuff that you just don't get in a lot of other tours because everyone's like, we're going to fit it into this hour. And then you also can like customize your bottle. You can put like your little thumbprint on your Knob Creek, which is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. So is that, um, an, is that an extended tour or is that the, the regular tour? That's just their regular everyday tour. Okay. And another one that I want to mention, it was on my favorite tours on the bourbon trail, even though it's not a bourbon trail marked mm-hmm. distillery or, and they like to blend. They don't like to distill is bourbon 30. It's where my release came out of. And what they do is they're not really about distilling. Like, um, Jeff's family has been blending for years. So they're like, there are plenty of people that distill really well. What we like to do is we like to blend. We like to finish. We like to experiment. So they have finishing barrels. They'll put some staves in their barrels to like season it, all kinds of other things. And, but the cool thing is even if you just go in for a casual tasting, mm-hmm. You get to pull your tasting right out of the barrel and try something out of a barrel, Mm. which is not something you get to do on a day-to-day basis. Unless you're doing a private barrel pick, it's very rare you'll try anything out of a barrel. You can also blend your own bottle there, which is another really cool experience you won't get to have almost anywhere else. I was going to say, this sounds more like what you were going through in Scotland than, than what you do in Kentucky. Exactly. Like it's really like a one. And even in Scotland, like you can pull a single barrel bottle, Mm -hmm. but you can't blend your own whiskey. Uh, Like you can't be like, well, I want some of this barrel, some of that barrel and some of this barrel. And they'll teach you how to do it, which is really cool. Oh, that is awesome. So you can go back and be like, and you can name it whatever you want. Like they'll write whatever you want on the label. And it's $120. It's not inaccessible to the everyday person. Okay. And then my third favorite is definitely Maker's Mark. Uh huh. Because it's like a combination distillery and art gallery. It is beautiful. It is beautiful. Utterly gorgeous. It was the first distillery that I went to on my distillery tour, and I thought, "Wow, if, really? they're, all, if they're all like this, this is pretty good." <laughs> it really does take you from front to back through the process, get to taste the mash. When they did the tasting, it was one of the best descriptive tastings for me in terms of you know, how to start drinking a whiskey by nosing it and then going through the process of the Kentucky chew and, you know, getting the the whole kind of coat your tongue with it and then determine what the finish is. The only problem I had with Maker's Mark was that we had five to try and I felt like I was almost slamming them down. I couldn't, I couldn't drink five. It's like, that's too much in such a short period of time to be able to drink. But uh, yeah, I love that tour. I mean, they'll let you hang out. They won't kick you out because trust me, okay. I did a couple of tastes and I just kept mine around for a minute. <laughs> well, and they give you a little chocolate too when you walk out. So you got you get to do a little bit of a, of a pairing um, with that as well. So it, it was kind of a nice all-inclusive, I thought. Like, it, it was a really nice tour, and a lot of them will walk you through, like, Sitzel Weller does a great job at walking you through how to taste and, like, giving you different things. And a, a good amount of the tours in Kentucky will go through the proper tasting style. Mm-hmm. What I really found special about this distillery was the artwork. So do you know anything about uh, Margaret Samuels or her legacy? I don't. I don't. So she's one of, like, the badass women in whiskey because she's awesome. Mm-hmm. But she was, she got one of the first patents on a bottle. She got one of the first patents on a design. She patented her font. So she had to fight the government to give her all these things. And she was one of the first people that wanted to make whiskey appealing based on eye appeal. So that bottle is hers. The maker's mark Uh, is her design. That was all pushed. She did a lot of the business side for the family. While the men folk were all focused on distilling. uh She was out there like wheeling and dealing and selling. And she imported all of them from Italy initially. And Maker's Mark, literally, it has its own font, which is really <laughs> cool and kind of frustrating if you're trying to be like, I want to do a cool Maker's Mark thing. Right. Nope, can't use the font. Yeah. I do, um, rem- I do remember that story, actually. And it was kind of cool that you got to walk through the print shop and be able to pick up a label as, as you went through. But yeah, I mean, she was, uh, sh- she was marketing before marketing was cool. She was, and she actually changed how patents are done in this country, which is pretty fantastic. But in her legacy, as you walk through, 
They have Dale Chihuly stuff. They have Stephen Powell. Their um, cafe is done with these beautiful reflectionist paintings by Michael Floor. They're utterly gorgeous. And I walk through and I'm like, my cousin, he does artwork. So I'm really familiar. Like I keep an eye on like art when I walk through places, mainly because of him. Yeah. And looking at these places, I'm like, I recognize this stuff. I recognize this <laughs> style. Huh. And I'm like, these are not like your standard local Kentucky artist, even though they have a lot of those mm-hmm. in there. It's just beautiful as you walk through their tasting room. The blown glass design over the entire wall is oh, yeah. one of my favorite representations of like grain to whiskey that I've ever seen in a piece of art. Mm. So that's another one. Like even if you don't like whiskey, it's so cool to just walk around there. Yeah. And it's like, these are like thousands and thousands of dollar pieces of art. Like the Chihuly ceiling that they have, that Uh has to be over a hundred, probably close to a million dollars. I was going to say when you first walk into the place, they have a pretty mosaic in there as, as soon as you walk in as well. And you get uh, a little bourbon infused coffee, which is a nice start to the day. <laughs> yes. The mosaic is actually done by a local artist, mm-hmm. but they also have that huge, beautiful, um, what is it? The chandelier. Yeah. And that's by Stephen Powell. Okay. And, uh, now, another one that I want to ask you about, th- did you go to Barton's? Barton's, I did. I have been to Barton's. And I am super sad about what happened yesterday, and I hope that everyone's safe. Oh, no. What happened I don't know yesterday? if you saw, they had a huge accident again. Oh, Lord. Another um, uh, warehouse? No, it wasn't a warehouse collapse. However, I have an interesting story about that. Um, one of their, uh, one of their like, mash tanks busted Ugh. or collapsed into two other ones and a ton of their mash just disappeared so oh no if you can get barton's like i don't think it's gonna be on sale anytime soon <sighs> it's gonna hurt their production yeah absolutely well uh, you have a story about it. i have a story about it too which is that um that collapse happened at 11 o'clock and i was just leaving for my estate tour at 10 50 so oh my goodness i was there the day it happened did you hear it uh, we i did not hear it i was apparently i was in the uh, visitor center at the time that that it happened and nobody was saying anything but we kept seeing the fire marshal driving around and we're standing inside of one of the lower warehouses and i said is it normal that the fire marshal drives through here? And the guide said, uh, no, not, not really. And I love this tour. Cause he was like, when we started the tour, he said, um, this tour will go as long as you want it to. And we'll, I will show you anything that you want to see. We'll just go and it's free, which is a, a bonus on top of that. And we, you know, so it was very cool from that standpoint. Everybody was so nice to us when we went through and, uh, I saw so much about the distilling process that I hadn't gotten anywhere else, but it was when we got up into the, um, uh, in, into the distilling area, somebody came up and told the guide, um, you can't take anybody up the hill. Well, part of the estate tours, you get to go see the big wood carving of the 1792 bottle and the big, the biggest uh, barrel in the world. Um, and oh, I haven't been on the estate tour. I just went on their like standard tour. Okay, so when you go up there, you're supposed to be able to see all of that. Well, it was above the barrel where the warehouse was that collapsed, and um, so oh, no. we were just about to head up that way, and he wouldn't tell us, and they kind of whispered back and forth with each other, and he said, unfortunately, we've had some kind of an issue, and we're not able to take you up to the upper warehouses, but we will take you. You know what? They probably the didn't even tell him. They're just like, hey, no, <laughs> yeah. no today. Like, poor guy's probably like, I'm going to have to make something up because you weren't telling me what's up. It was funny because when I went uh, over to Willits for my next tour, Willits is where I found out what happened at Barton's. Uh, None of us knew, it. and it was funny that because it's insane. Yeah, so I, they give you a uh, a bunghole cork, and they date yep, it. Yep, I got mine. And they wrote estate on it, and so that's my proof that I was there on the day that the warehouse collapsed. So it was just a that partial collapse, but yeah, it was easy. Yeah, it was not. So do they still take you in the Rick House? Uh, they did. They took us all the way. We got to do everything. We went to the bottling facility and all of that. We just were not able to go up on that top hill. 
So when I went in the Rick house, what I found really ironic is this is the only tour that's ever done this. They showed us a part of the Rick house with this little like beaker thing, like little, it was like a little piece of wood on a string. Yeah. And I guess when it moves, you have to make sure to balance the Rick house. And they gave us this whole speech about like how important is balancing the Rick house to keep the Rick house from collapsing. I don't know if they did during your tour. <laughs> because you know the obvious yeah uh, they they didn't uh they didn't mention that so uh yeah but it must have been a sensitive like a, it was at least a 20 minute explanation during wow. our tour that and was... i thought it was really really cool and then the workout <laughs> stops and i'm like well i guess that little piece of wood doesn't work too well yeah that was probably a pretty sensitive subject for them well leslie i want to thank you for being on the show this week and before we let you go it would be fantastic if you would give us some details on some different ways that people can keep in touch with you and be able to see what you're doing on your journeys. So uh, where, where can they, where can they find more information about you? So whiskey is my yoga is my Instagram, Facebook and, um, dot com. Okay. And then my website's going to be changing a little bit. So I actually got the LLC for whiskey is my yoga. Ooh, so nice. I'm managing a couple places, social media, and like I once again, I have the, that big thing where I only do stuff for people if I believe in them. Mm -hmm. And then I'm doing some staff training on whiskey and food pairings because I really think it's a super underutilized industry. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I love to cook. And if you look at half my posts, it's like my home cooking and me picking a whiskey. I don't do that at random. I actually go through all my whiskeys to find something that goes well with my dinner mm. when I post it. Mm -hmm. And it's one of my favorite things. So I think it's super underutilized. But have you done any like whiskey and food pairings aside from the chocolate one? Uh, I have not really. I mean, uh, and that's one of those things that it just seems like a natural. But for some reason, I haven't bumped into it. So, yeah, a lot of places don't do it. But I highly recommend when you go to Isla, get some kind of cream pie, like a chocolate cream pie or Oreo cream pie, something. Mm -hmm. Try it with an Isla whiskey. It turns like all of those smoky flavors into like extra buttery goodness. Ooh, okay. It's amazing how it reacts with cream. Nice. Well, I, you are definitely going to be uh, the, the the person that's going to uh, open my eyes to some of these these new things as I keep watching your watching your blog because you you're getting so much more immersed in it than I can. <laughs> I, well, I'm definitely a little obsessive. Yes. Well, it's good. It's it's good for everybody who wants to learn more and uh, and be able to either get started into uh tasting whiskeys or you know take that extra step so um i am looking forward to watching what you do down the road and i appreciate all your time today and for all the great information you gave us yeah thank you for having me i really appreciate it are you primed up and ready to go on a whiskey tour i can tell you i definitely am and if you want to get any of the notes from today's show, go to the show notes page at travelfuelslife.com slash podcast. Look for episode number 18, and we have some bonus coverage for you, including two videos. And one of those videos has Leslie teaching us how to do tastings and to come up with profiles for whiskey so that we can learn a lot faster how to taste and appreciate whiskey so that's a great episode and we also talk a bit about her favorite bar in washington which is a place that i've been dying to go to we've got that content out there at travelfuelslife.com slash podcasts and she also gave us a link on her website to what her favorite distillery tours were on the bourbon trail and so check that out as well and make sure to follow me on facebook.com slash travel fuels life or instagram.com slash travel fuels life. In both those locations, I'm posting all of my great travels around Scotland that I'll be doing. And also look out for whiskey lore. That's right. If you go out to facebook.com slash whiskey lore, there's going to be some photos and content out there from a whiskey perspective. So check that out from Travel Fuels Life. And until next time, have yourself a great week, safe travels, and thanks for listening to Travel Fuels Life.